The year was 1945, and the nation celebrated the end of World War II and marked the beginning of a new era. But as a new era dawned, others appeared to be coming to a close. And by 1946, that's the way it seemed for some of Hollywood's greatest comedy teams. It's fun made to order, south of the border, with Ken Laurel and Oliver Hardy. After 103 film appearances dating back more than two decades, Laurel and Hardy were without a studio contract and would only make one more film together. He grabs Kirk by the neck like that, see, and drags him over to the letter press. See? Also in 1946, the Three Stooges, one of the country's most durable comedy teams with over 100 film appearances to their credit, suffered a terrible setback when Curly Howard, the most beloved stooge, had a stroke and was forced to leave the act. Curly was replaced by his brother Shemp, who had originally been with the Stooges in Vaudeville. But now the chemistry had definitely changed, and many fans agreed it was not for the better. Now, Valentine gets up, and he punched the ball. Now, when he punched the ball, me being a good catcher, I'm going to throw Valentine out of first base. So I pick up the ball and throw it to who? Now, that's the first thing you said right. I don't even know what I'm talking about! Even Abbott and Costello, who rocketed to national popularity on radio in the late 30s, and then in the movies during the 40s, were having their troubles. Off screen, a serious rift between Abbott and Costello had gotten so heated, they refused to do any routines together in two of their 1946 movies. Although the team would remain together through the early 50s, few of their later efforts duplicated the level of comedy achieved in the early 40s. I have a most important announcement to make. Most important. The Marx Brothers are retiring from the silver screen. That's right, folks. We're on our way. That's all right, folks. Well, where do we go from here? And so, to all of you, a fond farewell. In 1941, the Marx Brothers began a five-year self-imposed absence from motion pictures. They returned in 1946 to make one of their last movies. But their irreverent zany spark was dimmed, and Groucho, who was the driving force of the team, now had his eye on radio and the emerging new medium, television. And so, by 1946, the golden era of Hollywood's great comedy teams appeared to be winding down. But it wasn't over yet. Waiting in the wings was one more team, so unique, so outrageous, and perfectly suited for their time. Martin and Lewis, the last great comedy team. What would you do, boy? What would you do without me when I'm gone? Who's always been a regular guy? I'll love you till I die. We all sit around the campfire. Campfire. Was I too loud? No, that wasn't bad at all. Thank you. All right, take a look at this. What do you think? Looks like a sea monster to me, Captain. Hey, down there. Hello, fellows. Hey, sir. Oh, oh, oh. Wait, oh. What are you doing? Anita. That's Anita. She fell in. I'm going to go in and save her. I can't swim, but we'll both die together. Now, that didn't hurt a bit, did it? How do you feel? Feel good? OK? Come on, let's go. The comedy team of Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis lasted for a short 10 years, from 1946 through 1956, but no other comedy team could match their success. Seemingly overnight, the pair went from a rowdy nightclub act to a national sensation with earnings of $20 million a year. Their films became eagerly awaited events which rolled up incredible box office receipts. Their television appearances garnered unprecedented ratings, and they played to sold-out nightclubs, theaters, and arenas 
all over the country. Then, as quickly as it began, it ended. How Dino Crescetti and Joseph Levitch became Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis and their extraordinary 10-year roller coaster ride as America's last great comedy team is legendary. In 1917, Steubenville, Ohio had a population of 20,000. Many of them were Italian, Irish, and Swedish immigrants who had settled there to work in the steel mills just across the Ohio River. On June 17th, the population increased by one when Angela and Guy Crescetti had their second son, Dino. Dino grew up in a tough neighborhood and did not distinguish himself at Grant Junior High or Wells High School, where his main concern seemed to be singing and clowning around in class. At 14 years old and just in the 11th grade, Dino quit high school. The year was 1931, and the nation was caught in the grip of the Depression. For most people, jobs were few and far between. As a high school dropout with little skills, Dino had to take any job he could get. Some early jobs included delivering milk for his uncle, pumping gas, and manual labor. But all that hard work had an unexpected benefit, physical fitness. By his late teens, Dino was a well-built and agile 146-pounder who had discovered you could make a buck boxing. Fighting as a welterweight under the name Kid Crochet, he reportedly won 24 of his first 30 bouts. But his boxing career came to an abrupt end after he sustained serious damage to his nose. Prohibition and the Depression had turned Steubenville, Ohio into a wide open gambling town with the nickname of Little Chicago. And it was at one of Steubenville's many illegal gambling halls, the Rex Cigar Store, that Dino found his next employment. Working as a dealer and stick man, he earned $125 per week, enough money to help pay off his father's home mortgage and to send his brother Bill to college. For fun, Dino liked to visit some of the local roadhouses like Reed's Mill and Walker's Nightclub and entertain his pals by singing, especially in the style of the popular Bing Crosby. One night, band leader Ernie McKay saw Dino sing and asked him to join his band for $50 per week. Dino turned down the offer because it was $75 less than he was making at the gambling hall. But when the boys back at the Rex Cigar Store heard that Dino had turned down the opportunity of singing with a big time band, they decided to make up the difference in pay and forced Dino to take the job. Dino couldn't say no, and Dino Martini, band singer, was born. The next stop for Dino was Cleveland and the popular Sammy Watkins band and another new name, Dean Martin. It was while working in Cleveland that Dean met and married his first wife, Betty. By 1943, Dean and family were living in New York. An unsuccessful engagement at the Rio Bamba nightclub replacing Frank Sinatra, who had left for Hollywood, left him depressed and unemployed. Luckily for Martin, he acquired a new agent, Lou Perry, and he began making a name for himself. It was about this time that Martin caught the eye of Lou Costello. Abbott and Costello were one of the most successful acts in the country. Their films were top box office attractions, and they were in the third year of their national radio program. Costello decided to buy a piece of Martin's contract and put him into the next Abbott and Costello film. To get him ready for movies, everyone agreed the first order of business was a nose job. Martin was extremely sensitive about his nose, and nicknames like the Schnazola Sinatra didn't help. Costello advanced Martin the money for the procedure. Unfortunately, Martin squandered Costello's advance and had to raise the money from some of his old Steubenville buddies. The nose job was a total success, but Costello's movie plans for Martin fell apart after Dean got in the habit of buying expensive items and having the bills sent to his new co-manager, Lou Costello. In 1945, Costello angrily ended the relationship. Martin continued to sing at various New York nightclubs and out-of-town spots like Shea Puri in Chicago. It was during a booking in Montreal that Dean was first introduced to golf, which would become a lifelong passion. As 1945 came to an end, Dean Martin would have another brush with a film career. 
Two studios, Columbia and MGM, both showed interest in Martin, and screen tests were quickly arranged. Martin performed San Fernando Valley, a current Bing Crosby tune for the test. Columbia's reaction came quickly and bluntly from studio chief Harry Cohn, who said, and we quote, I have just seen Dean Martin. He is a complete waste of time and money. MGM producer Joe Pasternak also had his eye on Martin for a role in his upcoming musical, Tilt the Clouds Roll By, and actually signed him to a contract pending studio approval. Instead of the expected approval, though, Pasternak received the following response from MGM boss Joseph Skink. Quote, we already have Tony Martin under contract. Why do we want another Italian singer? Whether Skink realized that Tony Martin was actually Jewish didn't matter. MGM didn't want Dean Martin. In 1946, it could never have occurred to Martin in his wildest dreams that a skinny Jewish kid who he had first met in 1944 on the corner of 49th and Broadway would become his ticket to the movies and superstardom. Joseph Levitch was born on March 16, 1926 in Newark, New Jersey. From the very beginning, young Joey knew what he wanted to do, exactly what his parents did, and that is perform. Joey's parents, Danny and Ray Lewis, were well-established performers, especially in the Catskill region of New York, known as the Borscht Belt. Because his parents traveled constantly, Joey was brought up by his grandmother, Sarah, who lived in Irvington, New Jersey. But when possible, especially in the summertime, he joined his parents on the road. And by the time Joey graduated eighth grade, he had already developed an act, which consisted of comically mimicking the words of popular phonograph records, known in the business as a dumb act. At 14, Joey got a job as an usher at New York's Paramount Theater, and watching the comedy headliners perform only reinforced his desire to be an entertainer. He quit high school and joined his parents at Brown's Hotel, where he worked as a busboy while continuing to perfect his act. It was at Brown's that he met Irving Kay, a former comedian now working as a bellhop at the hotel. Kay believed in Joey, and in 1942 got him his first real booking in Hoboken, New Jersey. Convinced he could have a show business career, Joey decided to adopt his father's professional name of Lewis. And to avoid confusion with popular comedian Joe E. Lewis, changed his first name to Jerry. By 1944, at the age of 17, Jerry Lewis had a manager, Irving Kay, and an agent, Abby Greshler, who encouraged Lewis to MC along with doing his record act, which helped him get more bookings. And it was while working in Detroit that he met Patti Palmer, a singer with the Ted Fiorito Orchestra. In October of 1944, Jerry and Patti were married. Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis first became friends when they appeared on the same bill at the Glass Hat in New York. Later, when Lewis was staying alone in a New York hotel, he babysat for the Martins, who were in a room across the hall. In January 1946, both men were booked into the Havana Madrid nightclub in New York. Jerry asked if he could fool around with Dean after he finished his act. Martin agreed. Later that night, just as Martin had completed singing, Lewis appeared dressed as a busboy loaded down with dishes. Lewis dropped the tray and then started ad-libbing with Martin. The audience seemed to like it, and so did Jerry Lewis, who even asked Martin if they could team up. But Martin politely refused. Later that year, Jerry Lewis, who was still performing his solo record act, was booked sight unseen into the 500 Club in Atlantic City for $175 a week. It was a sheer disaster. Skinny D'Amato, the club's owner, who had reputed ties to the underworld, absolutely hated the act and was furious with Lewis's agent, Abby Greshler, for promoting the booking. Lewis was canceled after the first performance. In desperation, Lewis called Lou Perry, Dean Martin's agent. Perry then called Skinny D'Amato and offered Dean Martin's services for $500 a week if D'Amato kept Lewis on the bill. But D'Amato wanted Lewis out. Then Perry remembered Lewis's busboy routine from the Havana Madrid and told D'Amato, Martin and Lewis did a funny bit together. 
Skinny D'Amato reluctantly agreed. Dean Martin became the headliner, with Jerry Lewis billed as an added attraction. The show was not exactly the kind of draw that had people waiting in line for tickets. To get attention, Lewis and Martin staged phony drownings on the beach. Martin would appear to be rescuing Lewis as a crowd would gather to watch. Lewis would then jump up yelling, if you're like that, come see us at the 500 Club. On July 25th, Sophie Tucker witnessed one of the phony drownings remembering that the great W.C. Fields had employed the very same stunt many years earlier. She decided to pay a visit to the club that night. When Sophie Tucker arrived at the 500 Club at 8.30, she was not impressed. Jerry was doing his clumsy busboy routine while Dean tried to sing, and nobody was laughing, including an angry, skinny D'Amato. In desperation, Lewis jumped to the stage and began leading the band while ad-libbing and making faces behind Martin's back. The audience began to laugh, and so did Sophie Tucker. That night, the comedy team of Martin and Lewis was born. Would you mind very much sort of conducting the choir for me on this number? Oh, it's going to have a fit. <laughs> <laughs> you chose me above all them? <laughs> I like that a lot. A choir number? Yeah, I'll announce it and you get the boys all set. Oh, I certainly will. Oh, I'm so unworthy of you. <laughs> Sick man. Uh, ladies and we're going to do a little number title once in a while. That great picture, The Cruel Sea. <laughs> so, if you're ready. Ah. Mm. Uh... In January 1947, the official team of Martin and Lewis opened at the Lowe's State in New York for $1,500 per week. For the next year and a half, the duo broke attendance records everywhere they played, from Florida to Philadelphia and as far west as Chicago. Martin and Lewis exploded into full stardom in April 1948 at New York's Copacabana nightclub. The team hit the club like a tornado, wreaking total havoc. Between shows, Lewis even played doorman and parking attendant. Variety trumpeted their arrival, saying, Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis really hit the big time at the Copa. Here's a case of two being better than one. Martin and Lewis's rise to stardom coincided with the emergence of television. Their television debut was on June 20th, 1948, when they headlined the very first Ed Sullivan show, then called Toast of the Town. Unfortunately, there is no surviving kinescope of that historic broadcast. Martin and Lewis became sought-after guests on many early television programs, like this Jack Benny show with Bob Hope. The team's zany and unpredictable antics were perfectly suited to the infant media. Yeah. Why, you yellow belly? <laughs> you want to live forever? No, I just want to reach 40. <laughs> oh, we're not going to make that trip again, oh. Quiet, quiet. Me want dinner music. Liga Moda. You remember my drama. <laughs> playing a samba or a rumba? What's the difference? We ain't got any room to dance. You can move that fire. That fire. No, it's not a fire. No,
Well, Martin and Lewis make such a brief appearance, we ought to get them back for a bow. Anyway. I'm very happy to be able to be here today. <laughs> Their new television popularity helped increase nightclub bookings as well. In one case, their COPA appearances, combined with additional bookings at the Roxy Theater, were making Martin and Lewis $15,000 per week. But the one event that turned Martin and Lewis from a successful nightclub act into movie stars happened in August of 1948, when they appeared at Slapsy Maxie's nightclub in Los Angeles. Opening night found the club packed with celebrities and powerful studio executives. Everything went right for Martin and Lewis, including working with club band leader Dick Stabile, who was able to handle the team's unrehearsed chaos. Paramount producer Hal Wallace moved quickly to beat other studios and signed Martin and Lewis to a five-year, seven-picture contract starting at $50,000 a picture. They would also be permitted to make one picture a year on their own. Wallace later admitted he didn't have the slightest idea what they could do in front of a camera. Martin and Lewis's first picture was almost their last. Wallace had acquired the film rights to the popular CBS radio show My Friend Irma starring Marie Wilson. The idea was to cast Martin and Lewis as the boyfriends of Irma and her roommate. Dean would play Steve, a good-looking guy who owned a juice stand, and Lewis would play Al, a con man. Martin was fine as Steve. It was Lewis who was the problem. After a reported nine screen tests and crash acting lessons, the film's director, George Marshall, said, he's no good. Either we change the part to fit Jerry Lewis, or we get another actor to play the role. Wallace decided to have a new part written for Lewis as Seymour, Dean's nerdy assistant. Lewis refused the role. Wallace threatened to drop Lewis from the film. Lewis countered that Wallace's contract called for a team. As the argument raged on into the night, Wallace claimed he did not have to use Martin and Lewis in the same movie and would find a future picture for Lewis. Lewis, possibly afraid that Martin would do well in movies on his own, finally agreed to play Seymour. Although it was Jerry Lewis who was at the eye of the storm during the filming of Irma, success had claimed its first victim, Dean Martin's marriage. After a costly divorce settlement, Dean married his second wife, Jean, on September 1st, 1949. My Friend Irma premiered in 1949 with Martin and Lewis billed fifth and sixth. Opening to rave reviews, the team began a national publicity tour beginning at the Paramount Theater in New York. They played six live shows a day to jam-packed houses. Lewis's antics on and off screen were gaining him legions of fans, especially among teenagers. After a very shaky start, it was Jerry Lewis who had emerged as the star of the act. After a few highly successful guest appearances on Bob Hope's radio program in 1948, NBC signed Martin and Lewis for a weekly show of their own, starting in the winter of 1949. The show had a budget of $10,000. Their initial foray into radio proved disappointing, and the show ended in the spring of 49. But as the team's popularity continued to soar, NBC brought them back on the air in the fall of 1949. An increased budget allowed for first-rate writers and a supporting cast, which included their band leader, Dick Stabile. The new show was better than their debut effort, but it was evident, as one critic put it, this team has to be seen to be believed. In 1949, Martin and Lewis filmed At War with the Army, co-produced by their own company, York Productions but Paramount decided to hold up release of that film in order to capitalize on the success of My Friend Irma. In 1950, Paramount rushed out My Friend Irma Goes West. Directed by Hal Walker, the picture was shot in just seven weeks. Marie Wilson still received top billing, but it was clear that Martin and Lewis were the film's main attraction. Goes west. Everybody's got a girl. John Lund. 
He's got Marie Wilson as Irma. My partner, Dean Martin. He's got two girls. His old flame, Diana Lynn, from our first picture, and... A terrific new French star, Corinne Calvé. But me, who do I get for a flame mate? Pierre. What are you, crazy or something? You can't knock. You ain't got a canasta. Yes, the whole gang's gone wild. Wild Western, and they're even funnier than ever. With Dean Martin singing a raft of new song hits. Your love is yours because I love you. Heap big laugh maker Jerry Lewis, pulling one hilarious surprise out of the bag after another. Beautiful Corinne Calpe shows what makes her the screen's new queen of glamour. And of course, there's Irma herself. Bravo! Jerry Lewis seemed to be getting most of the limelight, but Dean Martin was also reaping some unexpected benefits. His recording of I'll Always Love You, which he sang in the movie My Friend Irma Goes West, became a hit and stayed on the charts for four months. As a result of their movie success and their impact on television, Martin and Lewis were chosen to be one of the alternating hosts of the new Colgate Comedy Hour. The staff included producer Ernest Luxman and writers Norman Lear and Ed Simmons. The show featured comedy sketches, guest stars, and songs by Dean. The program usually ended with a nightclub-style segment in which Dean and Jerry would perform with Dick Stabile and the band. In January 1951, At War with the Army, which had been shot in 1949, was released. With Martin and Lewis getting star billing, the story established a formula which the team would successfully continue throughout their career. Dean always played a self-assured leading man with an eye for the ladies, while Jerry played a zany, helpless man-child. Jerry would get into trouble, then Dean, acting as a big brother, would protect Jerry and sing a few songs along the way. The 1951 release of That's My Boy may have marked a turning point in Martin and Lewis's personal relationship. In the film, Lewis played the unathletic son of jarring Jack Jackson, a legendary football hero, while Dean plays Jerry's friend, a real college football star. Cy Howard, the film's co-producer and author, wanted Lewis to play his part with less mugging, but Lewis was uneasy about cutting down on his antics. Actress Paulette Goddard, who had been married to Charlie Chaplin and was currently Cy Howard's girlfriend, tried to help encourage Lewis by telling him, and we quote, 
You know, you don't have to do all that mugging. You're a great talent. You're better than Charlie Chaplin. Lewis took her comments to heart. And when the film opened, one reviewer said, Lewis has a real character to portray, and he knocks it off with conviction and consistency. Behind every good comedian is a good actor. Just how Dean Martin felt about Lewis's reviews and fascination with Chaplin, he kept to himself. To promote That's My Boy, Martin and Lewis began a national tour. The team would perform live on stage at movie theaters in between the film showing, in many cases for as many as six shows a day. Show business history was made in theaters like New York's Paramount, where the duo were guaranteed $50,000 a week, plus 50% of the theater's profit in excess of $100,000. But after the first show, most of their fans, made up of screaming teenagers, refused to leave the theater. Jerry Lewis finally got the fans to leave by promising them the next performance would be free outside the team's dressing room windows. The strategy worked perfectly. The theater emptied out as they put on short outdoor performances after each stage show. Martin and Lewis had broken all attendance records and grossed over $260,000, making them the highest paid act in show business. Martin and Lewis's next film, Sailor Beware, was a huge hit, costing less than $750,000 to make. The film's worldwide gross was in excess of $27 million. Remember, this is at a time when tickets cost only 50 cents. We're not showing Sailor Beware, we're just showing a few scenes, so when it plays here, the folks will come back to see it. What will we show them first? Well, Jerry, let's show them the scene where you meet the skipper of our submarine. I'm very glad we're going to be informal. My name is Melvin Jones, but you can call me Melvin. Go on, get gone. That's not so bad, Dean. What about the time you get me in a fight and I ain't even mad at nobody? Jerry, you know you're a real killer, especially with the girls. Now, what's this terrific attraction you have for them? like a sea monster to me, Captain. Hey, down there. Hello, fellows. Hey, sir. By 1952, no act in show business history was hotter than Martin and Lewis. Between their live appearances, movies, television, and radio, the team was making millions. Lewis's antics were mimicked by millions of fans, and the inevitable professional imposters surfaced, like the duo you're watching now. Nope, that's not Martin and Lewis. It's the look-alike team of Mitchell and Petrillo. At 16 years of age, Sammy Petrillo had an uncanny resemblance to his idol, Jerry Lewis. Lewis got a kick out of his young admirer and let him appear on the Colgate Comedy Hour. But Hollywood could not resist trying to cash in on the Martin and Lewis mania that was sweeping the country. So in 1952, they paired Sammy Petrillo with singer Duke Mitchell in the film Bella Lugosi Meets a Brooklyn Gorilla. Who are they? I'm not no master. Come on, Doogie, let's go. The doctor's probably busy, and besides, if I got something at the hut. What? We got to stay here. I'm getting out of here. Of course, other more established teams also took advantage of Martin and Lewis's skyrocketing popularity, like Hope and Crosby in The Road to Valley. <laughs> the 
The team's international appeal could be seen by this French language version of their next film, the 1952 release, Jumping Jacks. The two most dauntless paratroopers that ever hit the silk. Dean Martin and Cherry Lewis? Yeah, I'm scared, Dean. I'm real scared. <laughs> what are we doing here anyway? Well, we're trying to tell the people all about our new picture, Jumping Jacks. Why tell them? Let them see for themselves. Oh, it's high. When Dean's not jumping, the joint is, as he sings a host of happy hits. When Jerry's not walking on air, he's waltzing with a sensational new dancing partner. And here's the blonde lovely all the troopers fall for, luscious Mona Freeman. What is it? Extinguish fire. Extinguish fire? Oh. Have you seen maneuvers like this? You'll be jumping for joy as these paramaniacs leap into action in the wackiest war games on record. Sorry, I can't go in this The Martin and Lewis 1953 release, The Stooge, was directed by MGM and Paramount veteran Norman Turog, who would eventually direct six of the team's films. As a graphic example of Martin and Lewis's incredible box office appeal, The Stooge grossed more money than such Paramount classics as High Noon, Dial M for Murder, and Stalag 17. Turog recalled that Dean Martin was always relaxed on the set, and wanted to finish the day's shooting so he could get onto the golf course. On the other hand, Lewis had developed an intense interest in movie making and photography. According to Dean Martin, it all began when a friend gave Lewis a camera as a birthday gift. Lewis later bought a camera store on Vine Street in Hollywood. I am very happy to christen this new store, the Jerry Lewis Exchange Camera Shop, and I christen it now. <laughs> At home, Lewis recruited Dean, along with Hollywood friends like Tony Curtis and Janet Lee, to appear in elaborate 16mm sound home movies he produced and directed, many of which were parodies of hit films. On the set of their Paramount movies, Lewis became more increasingly involved in all the technical aspects of filmmaking, including restaging scenes and camera blocking, which sometimes caused lengthy production delays. The team's next film was the 1953 release Scared Stiff, which was based on the 1940 Bob Hope film called Ghost Breakers. It also marked the beginning of their new contract with Hal Wallace, a seven-year deal for one picture a year with a guaranteed salary of one million dollars. Those faces, those terrible faces, I can't stand it. Ah! Look, there they are. Don't be scared, folks. No, it's only us. <laughs> If you think that's a tangle, wait until you see what happens to Dean and Jerry when a gang of ruthless killers get on their trail. Somebody's got to move. The heat's on in New York, so they stow away on a cruise to Cuba. Now I know what a sardine feels like. But the chill is on in the haunted castle of Lost Island. Both Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis as a team and as individuals have raised millions for charity. Reportedly, their well-known association with muscular dystrophy began because the team became aware that their television director, Bud Yorkin, had a sister who suffered from the disease. To help raise the public's awareness about MD, Lewis began making public service announcements at the end of the Colgate Comedy Hour. 
The team's first telethon was in 1952. The event raised money for a New York cardiac hospital with a portion also going to muscular dystrophy. The first full muscular dystrophy telethon actually took place a year later in 1953. Since then, Lewis has helped raise over $1 billion for a muscular dystrophy. The 1953 film, The Caddy, released by Paramount but produced by Martin and Lewis's York Productions, had a rocky history. Based on a story idea by Colgate Comedy Hour writer Danny Arnold, Lewis demanded the studio buy it for their next film. Paramount refused. Lewis countered by telling the studio that if they didn't make The Caddy, he wouldn't make any more films for Paramount, and then walked out. After a two-week absence, Paramount gave in, and production began. His buddy Dean is an up-and-coming golf pro whose swing is just as sweet as the love songs he sings to beautiful Donna Reed. Jerry's got a gal, too, cute little Barbara Bates. Now take the club back, slow and easy. I wish it keep your head down. But now stand by for just a few short snips from just a few hilarious high spots in the funniest comedy Dean and Jerry have ever made. There's disaster in the department store. <laughs> Catastrophe in the country club. Hey, buddy, you got a towel. Somebody took mine. Pandemonium at the dinner party. Hey, Charlie, everything... Oh! Uproar on Broadway. Oh, what would you do without me? What would you do, boy? The Caddy produced the only hit song to come out of a Martin and Lewis movie. That's Amore was a song that Dean Martin did not want to sing, but the studio had paid a lot of money to songwriter Harry Warren to write the songs for The Caddy and finally persuaded Martin to sing it. That Samore was nominated for an Academy Award and sold over two million records, and in the process, turned Dean Martin into a recording star. The 1954 release, Money From Home, was the team's first color film, and it was also shot in 3D. Although it was not considered one of their best efforts, it still made a handsome profit for Paramount. The team had become an important part of Hollywood's movie community as shown by this high-profile appearance at the 1954 Academy Awards. To present the next song, I'd like to introduce the man who dubbed Mary Olanza's voice in the great Caruso, Mr. Jerry Lewis, right here. <laughs> Thank you, very, oh, thank, you, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very, very happy to be here this evening. And uh, the Academy expressed their desire to uh, have me sing a number. <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, throughout the course of 1954, there were no tunes that seemed to suit my voice. <laughs> so we feel that we have a gentleman who is certainly suitable for the fifth nominated song, a very beautiful melody sung by my good partner, Mr. Dean Martin. Dean. For Martin and Lewis's next film, the 1954 release Living It Up, Paramount delved into its vaults and used the 1937 David O. Selznick production Nothing Sacred as the basis for Living It Up. Jerry takes on the role originated by Carol Lombard as a small town resident believed to be dying who was given a trip to the Big Apple by a New York newspaper as a human interest story. Many critics believe Living It Up to be the best of the Martin and Lewis films. They're the biggest sensation that ever hit Big Heart in New York. Because thanks to that beautiful sob sister, Janet Lee, everybody in town thinks Jerry's going to die of radioactivity in a few days. But just between us, the kid's a lovable fake. Just look at him kick up his heels with that shimmying bombshell from Broadway, Sherry North. Dean's got a stack of song hits. And Janet's just the gal to sing them to. Money burns a hole in my pocket. And Jerry's got them all bamboozled with his frantic antics. Oh, 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 oh direct it, bring it in. Oh, sure. I am a little Dr. Tonsi Lee. 
I'm young. A nice, a nice boy. On your feet, you phony basset hound. Wally. And you keep your hands off of me, you singing crack. Should I try bombs away? Well, you'd better try something, because in a couple of hours, the whole city of New York is going to be banging at the door, howling for your blood. <laughs> A serious rift between Martin and Lewis developed during the filming of their next movie, the 1954 release, Three Ring Circus. The original script called for Jerry's character to be introduced in the first 20 pages, followed by Dean's character in the following 20 pages. The team would not be together on film until page 40 of the script. Both Martin and Lewis objected. Producer Hal Wallace tore up the first 40 pages saying, there, now you've met. But in truth, it was very much Jerry's film. One day after Lewis had filmed many solo scenes, Dean was finally needed on the set. Some of the extras who were seated in the stands yelled out, Hey, Dean, where you been? And are you still Jerry's partner? Later, Dean found Jerry being photographed for a magazine article alone. And Martin muttered, What am I, a fifth wheel around here? They're higher than ever, wilder than ever, more hilarious than ever, when Dean and Jerry take over the circuit. Hey, no, wait, 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 when a woman wants something, she takes it. Well, what do you got in mind, I hope? <laughs> now, you laugh real nice. I don't think Sadia. Sadia who? <laughs> Wait till you see him tame those ferocious lions. No, 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 no yelling. No, no yelling. Punch a bell, knock a bell. You ring the bell, the bell, the bell, the bell. By the time filming began on their next feature, You're Never Too Young, rumors had started to circulate that the team might split up. In an effort to stem the rumors, positive stories about the duo were rushed out, including a statement by Dean declaring, When we shook hands on our partnership, I said in my heart, this is forever. It still goes. But insiders knew better. You're Never Too Young was actually a remake of a 1941 film, The Major and the Minor, with Jerry playing the role originated by Ginger Rogers. Can you imagine? Dean and Jerry cutting capers with the cute little chicks in an all-girls school. But if you think you're ever too young for loving and laughing, look at Jerry masquerading as a little boy. You see, everybody thinks he's just a crazy mixed-up ten-year-old, including the public enemy who has him worried to death and the gorgeous schoolmarm who teaches him the facts of life. Hello, Bob. Hello. Look, you stick to the little ones. The big ones are mine. Song hits by the score. Like this catchy love ditty Dean croons to Diana Lynn. I know your mother loves you. Your father loves you, too. And talk about laughs. This time, Jerry really tops himself. We all sit around the Very too loud? No, that wasn't bad at all. Thank you. Wilbur! Stop him, he's a crook! I got him! Hey, he's taking it away! Don't worry! I, I, I got him now! I, I got him! Oh, oh! I can't
The 1955 release of Artists and Models is notable for many reasons. On the positive side, it introduced movie audiences to 19-year-old Shirley MacLaine. But on the negative side, the film's production budget was more than a million and a half dollars, three times more than Paramount wanted to spend. Producer Hal Wallace pointed to Jerry Lewis's constant involvement in all aspects of production for causing the skyrocketing costs. And to make matters worse, Dean and Jerry were hardly talking to each other. In spite of the constant anxiety, director Frank Tashlin managed to turn out one of the most unique looking and enjoyable of the Martin and Lewis films. Those two merry-making buddies are surrounded by acres of gorgeous bodies in the super musical that's glorified in this division and loaded, simply loaded with color. Yes, the laughs come by the bucket full with the song hits right behind. Shirley MacLaine is that terrific redhead you've been hearing about. The most exciting and delightful star discovery of the year. Everybody says that Shirley's going far in pictures. Jerry thinks she's gone too far already. No. But when it comes to blonde, Dean's cornered the market with statuesque Anita Ekberg, enticing Ava Gabor, and beautiful Dorothy Malone. And right along with all the music and fun, you'll love this unusual story. For just like Jerry says, this one has a brand new twist to it. Ah. Oh, I gotta get new souls. <laughs> We absolutely guarantee you'll be all tied up in knots, too, just from laughing so hard at those ex-kangaroo patrol members, Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis. Yeah, oh, oh, oh. Oh, my trainer, who dogs and dabbles with the brushes. With rumors flying of the team's imminent breakup, it was ironic that in 1956, their next film was called Partners, Actually, it was a remake of the 1936 Bing Crosby film, Rhythm on the Range. Oh, wait a minute. You've got to take me with you. Come on. Your father and my father were partners. They died together. When I'm ready to die, you can be my partner. Oh, we can be partners. We're like swell. When I die? The Vista Vision screen is wide open for howls when Dean and Jerry head for the wide open spaces. Say, I'll bet you dance real pretty. Oh, no, I can't dance at all. No, 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 oh, wait, oh, wait. Well, Jerry's going sparking with perky Jackie Lockery. We better get back to town. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> yeah. no! And when they elect Jerry Sheriff, the riot really starts rolling. There's fighting. Wait, couldn't we just talk for one thing? And dancing. First old couple, rip and start. Down the center and cut them off short. Lady go gee and a gentle hawk. Circus and leopardy roll grandma. And shooting. Who wants to go first? They're fighting! They're in March 1956, Martin and Lewis opened at the Sands Hotel in Las Vegas. When not performing, the two men hardly spoke to each other. Martin's wife, Jean, urged Dean to take more control of the partnership, which seemed only to put more strain on the act and on Dean's marriage. Their next film, Hollywood or Bust, would be their last. The original screenplay was written by Erna Lazarus, who happened to be on the set one day and overheard Jerry Lewis warning a stagehand that he intended to make it as difficult as possible for everybody connected with this picture. Many observers believed it was Jerry's way of indirectly forcing a breakup with Dean. Adding to the unbearable tension was Martin and Lewis's blow up about a future film. While shooting Hollywood or a bust, the script for another movie, The Delicate Delinquent, was being written. Dean would play a policeman trying to help Jerry, an apprentice janitor, get on the police force. Dean read the script and confronted Jerry, telling him he didn't want to play a uniformed cop but would rather be a detective. Jerry then coolly suggested that if Dean wouldn't play the part, they might have to get somebody else. Dean shouted back, if that's the way it's going to be, maybe they should start looking for somebody else, and stormed out the door. On June 18, 1956, just one day before the completion of Hollywood or Bust, Martin and Lewis publicly confirmed that they were breaking up. There's music and mirth all over the map as the boys take off on the transcontinental gal chase that will keep you in the state of hysteria. 
There's mania in Pennsylvania when a Great Dane goes off with their car. A lucky day in Iowa when they bump into Pat Crowley, roaming through Wyoming, where Jerry starts throwing the bull. I, I just came for milk. Nice, nice bull. Is milk in a bull? That's impossible. That's what I thought. Arizona's kick is an Indian chick doing a rock and roll war dance. And watch them flip on the Las Vegas Strip when the boys go crazy at the craft table. 30 to 1 if it rolls two ways. Two ways, 30 to 1. Roll them. Come on. Oh, oh, Steve, why'd you faint? But we gotta warn you, the laugh quake's coming to California when they come up against gorgeous Anita Eckberg in Hollywood or Bust. Oh, 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 wait, oh, what are you doing? Anita, that's Anita. She fell in. I'm gonna go in and save her. I can't swim, but we'll both die together. All attempts by the studio, agents, and friends to reconcile the team failed. Even Abbott and Costello took a full-page ad in Variety, urging Martin and Lewis not to break up. Ironically, in a matter of months, Abbott and Costello would also split up. Martin and Lewis returned to the East Coast for their final shows together, including a farewell 10-night engagement at the 500 Club in Atlantic City. On July 24, 1956, Martin and Lewis gave their last performance at the Copacabana. As members of the audience implored the duo to stay together, they put on one of the greatest closing nights in show business history. The show ended with the team singing Partners, Buddies, and Pals. At that moment, Martin and Lewis, the last great comedy team, ceased to exist. One month later, while on vacation in Las Vegas, Jerry Lewis was asked to fill in for an ailing Judy Garland at the New Frontier Hotel. Lewis ended his first solo performance by singing rock a -bye, Your Baby, and the audience loved it. rock a -bye, rock -a -bye, baby, with a deep sea, and a Lewis was so encouraged by the crowd's reaction that he recorded the song for Decca Records. Lewis's debut solo film was The Delicate Delinquent, the very same film Dean had refused to appear in. Dean had been replaced by actor Darren McGavin. During the production of the movie, Jerry's recording of Rockabye Your Baby became a hit and sold over one million copies. The Delicate Delinquent grossed over seven million dollars. Jerry Lewis's solo career was off to a very fast start. A soft-hearted guy trying to get along in a hard-boiled neighborhood. Sydney, I want to give you a present. Oh, really? What is it? This. Isn't that nice, Sydney? It's very nice. But things aren't all bad. This cute little chick thinks he's wonderful. Am I unattractive? Oh, no, no. Then why in the world do you constantly ignore me? Why in the world? Because I'm nothing. You don't deserve to be with that or nothing. You wait till it's something, me. When I'm something, then I'll talk to you. I want to be looked up to and respected. You will be. I want to be a cop. That's Darren McGavin as Jerry's buddy in blue, helping Jerry become the dizziest recruit who ever went through the police academy the hard way. Taking lessons in wrestling. But I got one of my own little tricks. Get out of that. I got a map. Lessons in gunslinging. Lessons in street fighting where Jerry bumps head-on against his ex-pals on the wrong side of the law. Dean Martin's first solo attempt was not nearly as successful as his former partner's. Turning down the lead in the film version of The Pajama Game, he opted instead to star in MGM's 10,000 Bedrooms. Feminine temperatures will definitely go up on the arrival of that bachelor with 10,000 bedrooms. 10,000 bedrooms? Like this? That's probably him now. Next stop, Rome. 
land of Caesars, Michelangelo, and Lola Brigida. What do you think of our Italian women? The same as I think of all the other women. They're beautiful, wonderful, charming, and I love them. The film was a box office disaster. And the New York Times said, Martin is a fellow with little humor and a modicum of charm. Martin tried to recover by performing at the Sands Hotel in Las Vegas. And then Dino's luck surfaced again when his agent convinced 20th Century Fox to give Dean a part in the film The Young Lions. Here is Irwin Shaw's monumental bestseller, the book that was read and acclaimed across the length and breadth of the civilized world. Dean Martin as Mike. The Broadway wise guy. Maybe why don't we just sit and be quiet? And then what? Then you kiss me. Martin surprised everyone by holding his own with actors like Montgomery Clift and Marlon Brando. The film became one of the biggest hits of the year, and Dean Martin's future as a solo star was assured. Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis, the most popular comedy team of all time. For 10 fabulous years, this unlikely duo blazed across the show business sky. The intense heat that their shooting star generated may have also consumed them, but each man rose out of the wreckage of their partnership to forge incredible solo careers. Now, when we look back at the team of Martin and Lewis, it is not with a sadness for a career that ended too soon, but rather as act one in the legendary lives of two remarkable men. Oh. Uh -huh. 